ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery depicting awesome apocalyptic events. For many, the Bible and its prophecies seem shrouded in mystery. Words like Armageddon and tribulation frighten millions, while others wonder how to avoid the mark of the beast or being left behind when the Lord returns. Can we understand the Bible? Yes. And Jesus holds your key to unlock a future without fear. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents The Prophecy Code with Doug Batchelor. Today's study, Revelation's Rapture. Good evening and welcome to another evening here at Prophecy Code. And we are so thankful that the Lord has chosen to inspire you to tune in again. This is our second night and we have many nights ahead of us. Tonight's wonderful message is Revelation's Rapture, what the Bible says about the glorious coming of Jesus Christ. My name is John Lomakang. I'll be your host for the series. And I want to welcome those joining us from around the world. We discovered today that we're translating in Spanish, Portuguese, French, and friends, here's some good news. We're taping it for broadcast later on on the internet in Chinese. Can you say amen? amen? The Lord is blessing as the gospel is in fact going around the world, preparing the world for the coming of Jesus Christ. But before we go into our series tonight, I'd like to encourage you to bow your heads with me as we invite God's presence to be here tonight. Gracious Father in heaven, this is your time. This is your word. We are but vessels in the hand of an omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And tonight we invite your presence to be here to not only inhabit this place, but abide in your people. We pray a special blessing on Pastor Bachelor tonight as he unfolds the word of God. And because prophecy, Lord, is an indicator of how soon your return is, give him wisdom and clarity of thought and insight to excite our hearts and that we may be ready for the coming of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Friends, now join me as we welcome our speaker, president, and director of Amazing Facts, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Good evening. I am so thankful to see each of you here, and thank you, John. Uh, Jesus is coming on time. Amen? You know, we have uh, some very exciting things to share with you. I think John already mentioned our subject tonight is Revelation's Rapture. And there is a study guide that goes along with that by the same title. And um, from this point on, our presentations are going to be following the study guides fairly closely. Uh, of course, I'll be expanding on that with a little extemporaneous teaching. My wife calls it speeching. It's kind of like preaching and teaching together, I guess. And uh, are you ready for some Bible questions that we have for tonight's program? We're going to dedicate a little time each evening to Bible questions. Good evening, and we're so glad that we're here with you tonight and that you're here with us. Our first question, last night you said if someone could email you and let you know what one with 33 zeros after it, they should, and someone did, and it's called a decillion. There you go. I'm One with 33 zeros is a decillion. You better write that down. You might use that frequently. <laughs> you won't be using it with your bank account, I'll tell you that. <laughs> All, All right. right. Our next question is, is Isaiah 4.1 referencing that the seven churches in Revelation are all claiming to be self-righteous movements? No. In, remember, we quoted, uh, we used Revela I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 as an illustration. It says, In that day seven women will take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. That's fairly close. That is talking about uh, churches all at one time in the last days. Now, it is true in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus gives seven messages to the seven churches. Those seven churches represent three things. First of all, it represents a cycle of history that God's church goes through from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming. Church starts out with that first love and then it begins to slip during the church of Ephesus 
and uh, goes through those stages of Smyrna and Thyatira and Philadelphia and Sardis and Laodicea and so forth. And it's a cycle that the church goes through over the history from the first coming to the second coming. We are now living in the age of the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm, indifferent church. It's also a cycle that churches can go through. Some congregations raise up, they're on fire, they've got that first love, and then you track them a couple of generations later, they're lukewarm. It is also a cycle that an individual can go through in their experience with Jesus. We start out with that first love, and over the years we can lose it. And so it's a warning, it's a cycle that people sometimes go through. And Jesus warns against the pitfalls of the Christian experience in those seven churches. All right. Will the coming Antichrist be a person, computer, or organization? We have a lesson on the Antichrist, and we're going to answer some of your questions by saying, keep coming. And so we've got a lesson on that, so I don't want to say too much. How reliable are our dreams as a predictor of the future? Well, if you're a prophet, they're, uh, if you're a prophet of God, they're very reliable. Um, most of us, our dreams are the result of uh, everything from your, your mind is sort of rebooting, your computer is rebooting during the night. It really does. You just sort of process that stuff. In Ecclesiastes there, Solomon says, a dream comes through the multitude of business. Now, I know I used to snow ski a lot when I went to this one school in Maine. And after a week of snow skiing, I would go to sleep at night and I was in my dreams. <laughs> and um, I play racquetball. <laughs> no, you've never noticed this before, but I, 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 she may have noticed the next one here. I play racquetball now. I haven't lately, but I'm, I mean, not since I've been here, but I, I like to play racquetball, which is a very fast game. You gotta react quick. And sometimes I'll lay down to go to sleep. All of a sudden I'll go <laughs> <laughs> And then my, it's coming, through, repetition makes you dream. And so that might have something to do with it. And sometimes, like I said, it's, it could be something you ate, indigestion. Occasionally, God will speak to you through a dream, and it's just between you and the Lord, and it may not be a message for everybody. Joseph interpret, interpreted some dreams that God evidently gave to the butler and the baker for the Pharaoh that were not dreams for all history, but just for those individuals. So um, it's, they're usually not accurate predictors of the future unless you're a prophet of God. Well, how do we know when somebody has a dream if it is uh, good, good from a prophet of God? Good question. I keep her up here because sometimes I'm not clear and she helps me. In the Bible, when the Pharaoh had a prophetic dream, he knew it was not an ordinary dream. He called all his wise men together. He said, I've had a dream and I need to know what it means because I know it's from God. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that was not an ordinary dream. His sleep went from him. He said, I've got to know what this means. I know it's from God. When God gives you a dream, there is an impression, an intensity with it, a discernment. You'll know that this is an inspired dream. I've got to know what this means. Um, very few of us have those dreams. You may not know how it feels. Thank you. All right. Why didn't Jesus tell us exactly when he's coming back? How many of you wait until a few weeks before the 15th to pay your taxes? Would you like to show your hands? <laughs> if you love the IRS more, you'd do it sooner. <laughs> now, there's really a point in that. Um, when, the Lord does not want us to get ready for his coming because we are afraid of him. He wants us to be ready, not just to get ready at the last minute. I, I heard this story about uh, New England. You know, the fishermen would go to see these whalers sometimes for years. And their wives did not always know when they were coming back. And there were a lot of scenarios about some of these wives. They always kept the light burning in the window. The house was clean. The, the kids were clothed and things were taken care of. And they just never had to worry when their husband was coming home because they were always ready. And then there were some other wives that were fooling around while their husbands were gone. The kids weren't being taken care of. And they're always looking out the window fretting and that they might get caught so they could scurry around at the last minute and clean things up. Well, the Lord wants us to have a relationship with him where we, where we are ready and we stay ready. Amen? And so he says, if I give you the day and the hour, your motives might be wrong. Just if you love me, be ready. All right. Could 666 be King Solomon? Read 1 Kings 10, 14, and it has in there 600, 3 score, and 6. Would you like me to read it? 
I'll tell you what that says. I'll check. It, it tells us that uh, in one year, Solomon uh, received 666 talents of gold. And some are wondering that because uh, that number is connected with Solomon's reign, maybe he has something to do with the Antichrist. The problem with that, well, first of all, the number 666 does represent the power or the rule of man. So in that respect, Solomon was a great, powerful ruler during that time. But in Revelation, that's a long time after Solomon. So why would God warn us about this beast power and say it's the number of a man, 666, and be telling us about Solomon, who had been dead for a thousand years? So obviously, it's not referring to Solomon. When you read in Daniel chapter 3 about the image that is made, it's a parallel to Revelation 13. Revelation 13 says whoever worships the image of the beast, um, they're going to eat the mark of the beast. Those who don't worship the image of the beast can't buy or sell. You go to Daniel chapter 3 where it talks about the image of the beast. It says it was 60 cubits by 6 cubits. And in Hebrew, if they don't give the, wet, the width as well as the depth, it's going to be the same. In other words, if they only tell you um, about the height and the depth, that would mean the width is the same as the depth. Which means that image was 6, 6, 6 in its dimensions. Very interesting. So the number does appear other times in the Bible. Thank Sorry. you. That's fine. You sound as though you believe the Bible is literal. What about evolution? How can all the scientists be wrong? Last night you were praising technology. Well, I do praise technology, but I think we all know that even technology has its uh, pitfalls. And every now and then the FDA recalls a drug because they find out it's killing people. Uh, and so we are human. Every now and then, heaven forbid, a, a space shuttle falls out of the sky. Uh, so even technology is not perfect. And I, I'm very thankful for the wonderful advances of technology. You can ask my wife, uh, when I first got a computer, she was a widow for a couple of years. <laughs> because uh, I was fascinated <laughs> with the new toys that I get, yeah. But uh, no, I love technology. But there is no conflict with believing in proven science and believing in the Bible as a literal, dependable book. I used to be an evolutionist. I believe that everything evolved and that all life was a big biological accident. Uh, now, because of scientific reasons and logic, I don't believe that anymore. I can't believe that. Uh, some examples would be, well, first of all, the whole theory of evolution is under serious uh, scrutiny right now and, and is really in a desperate state because well, for years they you know, taught the Big Bang and that all these dinosaurs died off slowly, but then the fossil record was proving they all seemed to die in a flood. And they said, well, an asteroid must have hit the Earth and caused this cataclysmic flood. Well, we know what the cataclysmic flood was. It's in the Bible, right? And then uh, uh, one of the biggest problems was when they started developing the theory of evolution. It was back in the days of Darwin and Louis Pasteur. And when they looked through a microscope, all they could see with their microscopes back then was a simple cell. And they said, oh, it looks like an egg. I think that could happen by accident. But now when they look through a microscope and they see a cell, listen to this. John and I used to live in New York City. Picture the complexity of New York City at rush hour. Think about all of the electricity flowing through the buildings, the people going in and out, the elevators moving, the technology, the communications, the plumbing, the taxis, the, the transportation system. Think of the activity of New York City at rush hour. Let me tell you what scientists say now. There is more complexity to a single cell of life than New York City at rush hour. Now we know that for that to happen spontaneously is not only unscientific, it's absurd. The symmetry, the organization, the design that you see all around you, to believe it happened, you know, I remember hearing a story about, um, this is important, so I'm taking some time with this. Uh, I remember hearing a story about a creationist who had a friend that was an evolutionist, and they'd go back and forth quite a bit. And one day, um, the creationist went to the car with his evolutionist friend, and he was getting in his new car. And the evolution believer said to his creation friend, his Christian friend, so, where'd you get the new car? And he said, well, you're going to have a hard time believing this. But um, I walked out into my garage one day, and there was a roller skate. It used to be a puddle of oil, but it turned into a roller skate. <laughs> and he said, I thought, I'm not going to touch this because it looks like something neat's happening. 
So then after some time went by, it turned into a skateboard, and then eventually it was a go-kart, and then uh, a Yugo or a Volkswagen, I don't know which was first, the Yugo or the Volkswagen, but it said, and then I came out and it was a Honda, and now I've got this Lexus. <laughs> and he said, oh, come on now, where'd you get it? He said, no, wait a second now. He says, you think it's absurd to believe that an automobile could happen spontaneously from a puddle of oil. What is more complex, a human being or a car? And the very first thing you know when you look at a car is that somewhere is a car maker. Why? Because there is interworking systems, there's organization, there's design. It must have intelligence. The idea that all of the creative genius that you see around you all the time happens spontaneously is absurd. Now, I'm not trying to ridicule you because I used to believe that, and I'm embarrassed. But it just is not scientific. Well, just when you see a baby and its birthing process, and it's just miraculous. It's just I don't a know miracle. how little people come out of big people. Me either. That is, <laughs> that is really strange when you think about it. And you know what? You made me think of something else. Pardon me, dear. In evolution, when it begins, they say that, you know, lightning struck the primeval ooze and somehow life was formed, a single cell of life. And you know how cells used to, according to evolution, procreate? They decide to start a family and that cell would split. And, you know, whenever things wanted to multiply, they just split in two. Well, that's very efficient when you think about it, and some cells still multiply that way. But uh, where would the need for male and female ever come from? where you have to have a cooperative act of love in order to create in your own image. It is the most impractical thing in the world. And it's almost like God has a sense of humor in that he made men and women so different. You know, it says, in, it says I will make her to be a help meet because man is incomplete without woman and woman is incomplete without man. And uh, one evolved on Mars and one on Venus, right? <laughs> okay. All right, that's all of our questions. Pretty intense, amen. amen. There is no Hollywood production or computer generated animation that can adequately portray what it is going to be like when Jesus comes back. Our presentation tonight is dealing with the subject of Revelation's rapture. And we'll say more about the specifics of the rapture in just a moment. But our central focus of the presentation tonight is not only going to deal with the certainty and the eminence, the nearness of Jesus coming, but we're going to talk about how he's coming. I like to always begin with an amazing fact. And, you know, for years now we do this radio program every Sunday night around the country and the world where people call in their Bible questions, and it's called uh, Bible Answers Live. And I, I've learned a lot because we've developed this big encyclopedia of amazing facts, and that's just really strengthened my faith in God's creative power. The octopus is quite a creature. Uh, I'm, Karen and I have our scuba license, and we just love the ocean. Closest you're ever going to get to heaven on this earth, in my opinion, is um, when you're floating around a beautiful coral reef, you've got that sense of weightlessness like you're flying and you have neutral buoyancy. You just can roll around and you see all these beautiful iridescent colors and the fish and the corals waving in the currents 
and uh, the great white sharks. No, but, but it, it has to be warm water. If it's cold water, it doesn't feel like heaven. And I, we've swum before with uh, the uh, octopus, and, and they are amazing creatures because I've watched them in a split second change colors dramatically. Not like a chameleon where it's just a different shade a little bit. They go from black to white. And not only that, they're, they're very intelligent. It, it's an amazing thing. They've got one of the bigger brains of the sea creatures. They know how to mimic other behavior. Some of them, they can instantly look like the sea floor on which they're appearing. They, they can look bumpy or smooth. The mimic octopus that you find in the Pacific has the ability to look like a snake. It can look like another fish. It can look like a, a stone. Matter of fact, it's so clever. It will, they can get into crab traps, eat the food, and get back out again. That takes intelligence. Sometimes what they do is they'll get into an abandoned clam shell. They use the little suction cups on their tentacles. They get inside and they'll close and open the shell a little like this so it looks like a real clam and they'll stick out the end of one little tentacle and make it look like a worm and some fish will come over to explore and then boosh it comes out and captures its prey. Very clever, very deceptive. They are the master chameleons. You know I use that illustration because uh, as much as I like octopus, they do make me think of the devil who I don't like, who is a master deceiver. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, Satan deceives the whole world. And don't underestimate him. We'll say more about the dragon in our study tomorrow night. But uh, right now we just want you to understand his masterpiece of deception is going to be around the second coming of Jesus. Now think about why this is important. When Jesus came the first time, were there prophecies in the Bible that told about his coming? How he was coming, uh, when he was coming, why he was coming. There were 200 prophecies at least in the Old Testament that gave a lot of specifics regarding the second coming of Jesus. But when he came, his people that had the word, were they ready? No, they were his people. My people, I'm Jewish. I, I haven't abandoned my being Jewish since I became a Christian. I'm still very thankful for that heritage. I think you can be a Jew and a Christian. Jesus was, right? So I hope there's no conflict there. And, uh, but they weren't ready. Even the apostles did not understand. You see, the reason is, in the Old Testament, not only were there prophecies that talked about the first coming, there's prophecies that talk about the second coming. The first coming is when he came as the lamb, the sacrifice. The second coming is when he comes like a lion, the conquering king. His people reversed those prophecies. So they took the prophecies about Jesus coming the, the first time, and they made that the second time, and they had him coming as a conquering king the first time. And that's why when, when Jesus was not asserting his power to overthrow the Romans and defeat their enemies and make Israel a nation once again, they became discouraged with him. And they couldn't understand it. And when he came, they weren't ready. Even the apostles misunderstood and they became discouraged. Could that happen again? Could the church be making the same mistake where we are inverting the prophecies and when he comes next time, instead of coming like a lion, we're teaching he's coming like a lamb? I don't think the devil's changed. And he is a master of counterfeit and confusion. Let's get into our lesson. Question number one. Can we be positive that Jesus will return to this earth again? What do you say? Yes. Well, there's a lot of scripture for that. First of all, we have some promises. Most of you know John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Do you believe him? Yes. Did he go? Has he gone to prepare a place for us? Will he come again? By the way, the language that Jesus uses in that parable, in a Jewish wedding, so much of Jesus' teaching was in the context of a Jewish wedding. The groom would give a glass of grape juice to the uh, girl he was proposing to. If she took it and she drank it, she accepted the proposal, and he would break the cup. Some of you have seen at Jewish weddings where they stomp and they break on the cup. Then he would go back to his father's house, and he would build a honeymoon chamber, and she didn't know how long that would take. And while he was building the honeymoon chamber, she was making sure her garments were prepared and clean and wrinkle-free. 
That's why the Bible says he's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. That's why Jesus told the parable of the ten virgins getting ready, waiting for the bridegroom to come. When he was finished with the honeymoon chamber, he would come back and get his bride. She didn't know exactly when that was. She knew when it was near because, you know, she had to be ready with her bridesmaids, but not the exact moment. And there was sort of this anticipation that was half, half the fun. And I think that's still half the fun for a lot of women when they get married is the wedding. I, I've done a lot of weddings, and I'll tell you, I've seen some young ladies spend a lot more time thinking about the wedding than the marriage. <laughs> and, and some have spent enough money on the wedding and they have to spend the rest of the marriage paying for it. <laughs> But can you imagine a groom going and preparing this honeymoon chamber and when he gets done, he folds his arms and he looks at it and says, wow, that's great. Now, why did I build that? What am I supposed to do with it now? If Jesus has gone to prepare this place for his bride, Revelation calls the church his bride, is he going to forget to get the bride? Of course not. Furthermore, it tells us in Matthew chapter 26, Nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You will see me come. Is he coming back again? There are many, many prophecies like this in the Bible, and I believe that we can trust them. Now, we're going to spend a little more time, most of our time, on question two, and we'll rush past some of the others that I think are easier for you to digest. In what manner or how will Jesus return the second time. Well, we can look at when Jesus went to heaven and learn something about how he'll come back from heaven. You can read in Acts chapter 1, when he ascended up to heaven after his first coming, while the disciples watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And the Bible says then that, behold, two men. Who are these two men? Angels, correct. They stood by in white apparel and they said to the apostles, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, if you want to know something about how he's coming again, look at how he went. The Bible tells us that when Jesus went, he left in the clouds, he's coming in the clouds. When he left, he was real, he was visible. When he comes, he'll be real and he'll be visible. It was a real event. Keep in mind, as we study the subject of the second coming, the first words out of Jesus' mouth dealing with this subject was, take heed, be warned, be careful, watch out that no man deceive you. First thing he said is, there's going to be a lot of deception about my coming. So don't automatically assume that the popular notions must be true. And don't forget that the devil, what makes deception deception is he commingles truth with error. And so there's always going to be an element of truth in the error. What makes poison dangerous is when you mix it with good food, right? Jesus said, there will be many false Christs. Many will come in my name saying I am Christ and will deceive many. You know, I'm from California and not far away is where Jim Jones had his temple. And I did some meetings in Santa Rosa nearby and I baptized a gal who escaped from Jonestown just before they all committed suicide. Baptized her. She was in a wheelchair. And uh, she said when they first started following him, he was, you know, he used to be a Methodist preacher. Good church. Read the Bible. By the time they got to Jonestown, things had digressed and he had thrown away the Bible. As a matter of fact, they kept the Bible in the outhouse. And then, of course, we know about uh, David Koresh and that whole fiasco. And I know somebody who was there. I don't know whether I should tell you this. In a seminar like this, you might think we're related. And I want you to know I never met David Koresh. If I did, I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, I preached in Waco one time, and his people came to the church where I preached they stood outside and handed out literature. They didn't care about what I thought was a wonderful sermon. I still remember. I preached on Daniel and the lion's den. And all they wanted to do was tell me, do you know the Holy Spirit's a woman? And I thought, this is kind of strange. <laughs> and then, of course, Jesus warns us. When therefore they say unto you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. There are going to be people who say, Jesus is here, he's there, he's on the ground. He said, don't even go if they say that. Why? Because it'll be like lightning. And of course, if 
Behold, if he's in secret chambers, believe it not. If he's in a spaceship and we're all supposed to gather, like Marshall Applewhite said. A lot of deceptions, but you know, this is not the deception. These characters that are basically deranged people are not the ones I'm worried about. Have you ever met anybody who claimed to be Jesus? I have. <laughs> it was really scary because I was all alone in the mountains when it happened. <laughs> and um, some of you have heard this story. It's the only one I've got. Sorry, it's what happened to me. I, I, you heard me say I used to live in a cave by myself. I'll say more about that later. And uh, I hesitate to say too much too soon because you might lose confidence. <laughs> but, uh, and I was a baby Christian. I read the Bible. I didn't know a lot about the Bible. And uh, I lived by myself up in this cave way back in the mountains. And one day into my cave yard, I had a yard, this man came walking. <laughs> It's pretty nice as far as caves go. And, I mean, I was way out in this remote area, and the guy had brown shoulder-length hair, beard, mustache, tan skin, hazel or uh, kind of green eyes, uh, not a bad-looking guy, and, and medium build, and he came and sat down. I welcomed and asked him if he wanted something to eat. I thought he was just a hiker, and after you visited a little while, he told me he was Jesus. And I thought, you know, if someone first says that, and you go, yeah. He wasn't laughing. <laughs> he was serious. Now, a couple of things go through your mind when that happens. I mean, this guy looked real intense. Uh, one thing you think is, I'm up here in the mountains all by myself with a lunatic. <laughs> and that was a little scary. And then I thought, well, I don't want to call him a lunatic. What if it is Jesus? I have a lot of questions to ask. And so you're not sure exactly what to say. And, you know, I was a baby Christian. And so I, I said to him, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to say, no, you're not. So I said, well, I've read in the Bible that when you come, that <laughs> you, you don't know what to say, that um, you're not going to touch the ground. We're going to be caught up to meet you in the air. He says, well, that's true. He said, and that's how I'm coming for the general populace, but I'm coming specially for a few people at first. And, you know, he had an answer for everything. He knew his Bible, which made him scary. And, you know, this went on. He, he, he ended up staying with me, and we had these prolonged Bible studies. And the more I read the Bible, the more I found this is not right. And not only that, he stayed with me three days. He didn't do any work. He ate all my food. <laughs> and I knew that Jesus would never do that. A few days later, I actually saw him down in Palm Springs, and he had found a disciple. Some tall, skinny hippie was following him around saying, this is Jesus. <laughs> and uh, if he found another 11, I'd really been worried. But... About a week later, I saw him on the streets again, and he had evidently gotten into a fight, and one of his eye teeth were knocked out, and I felt much better because I know Jesus has all his teeth. And so, <laughs> but, you know, we're not talking about these poor, deranged people like, you know, Jim Jones and David Koresh and Marshall Applewhite and this uh, gentleman in Japan who, the sarin gas thing that they had. And it, there, there's all kinds of crazy people out there, and that's not what we're talking about. What if Satan should impersonate Christ. How would you know that it wasn't Jesus? We need to know something about how Jesus is going to come. What would you do if all of a sudden it appeared on the news one day that Jesus had arrived? All of a sudden there's a, a news report and all around the world uh, TV cameras are tuning in. Would you go and sit down in front of the TV? Would you think that Jesus had come? He looked just like Jesus. Sounded just like Jesus. News reporters are saying, Jesus has returned, and all the cameras are flocking to hear the words and maybe doing some of the same miracles. Can the devil do some miracles? Doesn't Revelation say that he will perform wonders? How would you respond? We need to know how Jesus is coming. Now, I, I want to be very delicate in what I'm going to share because there are principally two conflicting views among Christians regarding how Jesus is going to come. You know, there are probably hundreds of different variants of those views, but there are two primary views. Let me share with you briefly what they are. The first view is that when the rapture occurs, the church will be caught up and the lost are left behind alive for seven years of tribulation. Then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back with the church that's been raptured and he then sets up his millennial kingdom here on earth. The other view is that the rapture takes place at the end of the time of tribulation. Now, virtually all Christians agree 
And I hope if you hear something you didn't believe before, you don't agree with, that we can agree disagreeably. Does that sound fair? Are we Christians? Don't we want to study together and find out what the Bible teaches? I mean, isn't it time, when Jesus comes back, aren't we going to be united as a people? Amen. How's it ever going to happen if we don't study together, if we're not afraid to ask questions and explore? So, in a Christian way, let's look at these things and find out what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm not going to be hedgy, and I'll tell you right out that when I first became a Christian, I worshipped with people who believed the popular view of what we call the secret rapture. Now, the Bible doesn't really teach the word rapture. Rapture means to be carried away with force or power. And that's where actually you get the word rape. It means to be carried away by force or with power. And uh, we believed it was the secret, or at least the people I worshipped with did, and that the tribulation happened afterward and that uh, we were caught up and when the Lord came people would suddenly disappear. It's basically the left behind scenario that has been made very popular. And then there's the other view that is a more traditional view. Um, some of you maybe had heard about a famous book written by Hal Lindsey years ago called The Late Great Planet Earth. Let me give you a little history here. How many remember this book? I think, what is it, 15 million copies sold. Back in the 1500s, a Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera was commissioned by our Catholic friends to study Revelation and kind of come up with what they called a counter-interpretation because the Protestant movement, uh, the reformers, and I'm thinking of people like Luther and Zwingli and Melanchthon and Calvin, they taught that the church would be in the world during the tribulation and we were caught up when Jesus came back and the wicked were destroyed at that time. But the Catholics were really having struggles with the Protestants, and so they said, we need a counter-interpretation. So Ribeiro wrote this interpretation that really didn't become very popular until a man named Darby, who was the founder of the Plymouth Brethren. Have you heard that church? It's called Darby's, until he embraced that. And that still didn't take off, but what really made it popular was a man named Schofield. Any of you ever heard of the Schofield Bible? He incorporated Darby's interpretation of Revelation in his Bible notes. And how Lindsay believed that, as well as some others, and popularized it with some books. So that amazing thing that happened is Protestants began to believe the Jesuit interpretation of prophecy, which basically says, Revelation 4, when John hears a trumpet and he's caught up in vision, that's the rapture, and everything from Revelation 4 on happens after the church is left. Now that's one view. I don't believe that. What I'm going to share with you from the Bible is really a very old view. What I'm going to share with you, a more traditional view, is the view that was believed by, well, like I said, you know, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and, uh, and Tyndale and Wycliffe and uh, Billy Sunday and Dwight Moody and I could just go down the line. I mean, it was a very standard teaching until the last 80 years or so. In Hal Lindsey's book, for instance, he believed that because Israel was being established as a nation in 1948, for which I'm thankful, that a generation later, 1981, the rapture would take place, and then after seven years of tribulation in 1988, then Jesus would come back down with the church and establish his millennial kingdom. None of it happened. None of it happened. And yet they keep selling books. No public apology. No saying, you know, we were wrong. And this has been true over and over again. Some of those who embrace these things keep using this philosophy and it's falling apart. I believe that everyone's going to know when Jesus comes. Now, I want to move along here. Uh, if this was view, if this uh, is a correct deduction, then within 40 years or so, Hal Lindsey says in late great planet Earth, 1948, all these things will take place. Well, none of them happened and there was no apology published. Many scholars who have studied the Bible prophecy all of their lives believe that this is so. Well, that's uh, those who went along with Darbyism. And then, of course, you know, uh, we've all heard of Tim LaHaye, and he wrote the series of books with uh, Jenkins' Left Behind series. He said in his book, No Fear of the Storm, no single verse specifically states Christ will come before the tribulation. Well, I want to go by what the Bible says. Uh, they're saying that there's no verse that really says Jesus is coming before the tribulation, which means he's coming when? After the tribulation. Um, you've got Darbyism that teaches the pre-tribulation rapture. The secret rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation. And then you've got um, 
And that also teaches it's not necessary really to understand the last 18 chapters of Revelation because the church will not be here during that fulfillment when the church disappears uh, because of the seven years of tribulation. By the way, can anyone here tell me where the scripture is that says seven years of tribulation? That's really putting my neck out on live television, international television, to invite you to give me a scripture. How many of you have heard? Turn a camera around in the studio. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Put your hands up. That's a pretty good group. And how many scriptures did we find? That ought to tell you something. That's very interesting. And then, of course, you've got what the reformers taught, which is where I am. And I, we can all love each other if we disagree. Amen? Amen. Let's study together. And you know what? If nothing else, even if you say, Doug, I, I know where I stand and you're not going to change my mind, fine. You owe it to yourself to at least understand your other brothers and sisters, right? So listen with an open heart and let's find out what, what each other believes. The reformers taught that the rapture of the church takes place after the tribulation. So let me tell you, uh, let me ask you actually a series of questions. In the Bible, let's talk about the tribulation for a second. Everyone here believes that Jesus is coming and when he comes and descends from heaven with a shout, we're caught up to meet him. That's the rapture. We're caught up to meet him. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and the plagues fell, don't forget the seven last plagues in Revelation are the tribulation. When the plagues fell on ancient Egypt, were the Israelites taken out of Egypt before or after the plagues? After the plagues. Were they in Egypt during the plagues? Yes. Did God protect them during the time of the plagues? Yes. Will we be protected during the time of the plagues? We don't need to worry about the plagues. Some people get so scared, they say, I don't want to believe the other way because I don't want to be in the world during the tribulation. You have nothing to fear. God will take care of you. That's what Psalm 91 says. Neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. Only with your eyes will you see and behold the destruction of the wicked. Don't be afraid of the plagues. Did God save Noah from the flood? or through the flood? Ah. Did God save Job from his troubles or through them? Joseph, did he go through trials? Was he saved from them or through them? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went through some trials. Did God save Daniel from the lions then or through it? Did he save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace or through it? The Bible tells us, Paul says, it is through much tribulation, we will enter the kingdom of God, he says in the book of Acts. So all through the Bible, we find this example. Why does Jesus say in Matthew 24 to the church, he that endures to the end, endures what? If we're going to go poof and disappear. Now I'll tell you why it's so important to understand this. I meet people all the time, and sometimes I'll meet a husband, his wife is the spiritual one in the family, and he says, well, you know, she takes this very seriously, and she says that she's going to get raptured, and I'll have to go through the tribulation, and I guess, well, if she gets raptured, I'll, I'll get real serious then because I'll have seven years, it'll be tough, but then I'll get my act together. Some people who believe that, it offers a second chance, and that's very dangerous. People who think they're going to have a second chance. And by the way, if whenever you're in doubt, believe the safe thing. If you, like me, believe that when Jesus comes the next time, that's it. You've got to be ready now, right? Amen. If I'm wrong, I'll apologize in heaven. But if you're wrong, and you're counting on a second chance, it's not safe. Now, some are saying, but Doug, it says in the Bible, Jesus is coming as a thief. Let's find out what the Bible teaches on that. Amen? He is coming as a thief. Does that mean that um, it, people are just going to disappear, or does it mean it's going to be a surprise? I think it means it's a surprise. Does life go on here on earth for seven more years after Jesus comes as a thief? Let's read it in the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Many people stop right there. Keep reading. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which, it means in this day, the heavens pass away with a great noise. And the elements melt with fervent heat. And the earth and the things therein are burned up. So what? What's the condition of the world when Jesus comes as a thief? Does it look to you like life is going on and people are saying, I wonder where everyone went? No, when he comes as a thief, the elements are melting with fervent heat. You could also read Matthew 24, verse 42. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would not watch and not to have suffered his house to be broken up. Now, I used to be a thief. I'll tell you more later. I don't want to say too much to begin with. <laughs> No, I was. I, I, did, I was a burglar. I've been in and out of jail. And, and uh, you know what? 
I never sent an advance announcement when I stole from anybody. <laughs> it was a surprise. Surprise was very important. And this is what Jesus means, is that it's going to be a surprise. Is it a surprise for the church or for the world? For the lost. Get your Bibles. You know, I, I read a lot of scripture on the screen, but I'd like to read this one. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in your Bible. Let's read another one here. We'll start with verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. What happens to the wicked when Jesus comes as a thief? Destruction. Does life go on for seven more years? Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they'll not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It's not overtaking. We should know when that time is near. Amen? You are sons of the light and sons of the day, not of the night and the darkness. Therefore, let's not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And so when Jesus comes as a thief, it's because the world was not prepared, but that's it. It's a surprise. Matter of fact, Jesus tells another parable. If you want to break into a strong man's house, you have to bind him. Does a man know when he's been wrapped up with ropes? Or is he going to go, what, where'd everybody go? The Bible says, let's look at some verses about the second coming. Quickly, we're going to go through them. Our God will come and shall not keep silent. I'm wondering if it sounds like a secret to you. It shall be very tempestuous round about him. You can also read, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, one of the noisiest verses in the Bible, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Does that sound like a secret to you? Again, you can, and that was 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. The Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation, and he will mightily roar upon his habitation. He will give a shout. That sounds very clear to me that when Jesus comes as a thief, that it is a very audible, loud, tempestuous event. Let me give you one more. Jeremiah chapter 4. Turn with me in your Bibles. Jeremiah chapter 4, we're going to go to verse 23. And here the prophet describes in vision the condition of the world just before the second coming. Jeremiah chapter 4, I'm sorry, just after the second coming. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. That sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? And the heavens, and they had no light. He's not talking about looking back. He's looking ahead. Notice, I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, the earth trembling. All the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, indeed, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled. Now, what does that mean? They were there, but now they're gone. Don't forget about no man and the birds fled. Jesus talks about the birds and the carcasses in, Revel in um, Matthew 24. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land, what was once a fruitful place, is a wilderness, and its cities were broken down. Why? At the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. And the word presence there, matter of fact, in the Greek, it's parousia, and it means the coming of the Lord. Question number three. Will the second coming of Christ be visible to all men? We've already found out it's very audible. What does the Bible say? Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and how many eyes? Every eye will see him. And again, you can read in Matthew 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they will see. They will what? They'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's a glorious event. That's not something secret. And then shall appear the, uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and all the tribes of the earth will, um, will mourn. It shall appear in the heavens. They'll see it. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So right away, you know that if someone calls you on the telephone and says, go grab your paper. Look on the front porch. See your paper. Turn on the news. Did you know Jesus came? You're not going to be watching reporters and pundits talking about, well, what was it like for you? And putting the microphone up in someone's face. Well, you know, there was this bright cloud, and all of a sudden people started popping up out of the ground. And it's not going to happen like that. When he comes again, everybody's going to know. Amen? It's the most glorious. It's the climax of the Bible is when Jesus comes. Who will be with Jesus at his second coming and why? Answer, Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Then he'll sit on the throne of his glory. Who's coming with him? A few angels? How many angels are there? Well, if every person has one guardian angel, and there's at least six billion people in the world today, don't forget that. There's billions of angels. These are the ministering spirits of God. Furthermore, his angels, speaking of his coming, will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then again, you can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, this is when he comes again, in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God. What happens when the angels come? They're taking vengeance on those that don't know God. That's why it's called sudden destruction when he comes back again. That's why the Bible says we should pray and watch and be sober lest our hearts be overcharged with drunkenness and the cares of this life lest that day overtake us as a thief. We should be watching because once that day comes, if we're not ready, it's forever too late. Friends, I just don't want your blood on my souls. I want you to know we've got to be ready now because we don't have another seven years to try to get serious about it. Now think about it in the Bible. He's coming with all these angels. And how many angels? Billions at least, right? What was that number? Decillion? Maybe. We don't know. But there's at least the billions. Remember in the Bible when one angel, you can read in Matthew, came down and rolled away the stone. The glory of that one angel was so terrifying and awesome that a hundred Roman soldiers just collapsed with fear and then fled in terror. Remember that? One angel. One angel of the Lord went among the Syrian army and in one night 160,000 men were killed. One angel. Do you think if the Lord comes with all his angels that someone's going to say, you'll never guess what happened yesterday. <laughs> you should have seen it. I got a digital picture. <laughs> but it's all washed out because it was so bright. Well, I'm not going to say that. When he comes with all the angels, it's, it's going to be the end. Everybody's going to know that. Number five, what is the purpose of Jesus coming? Now, some people think, oh, he's coming to get even. That's not why Jesus is coming. Jesus tells us why he's coming. John chapter 14, verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Why does he want to get us? Why is he coming? to receive us. He wants to be with us. He says, Father, I pray that those you've given me will be with me. What a privilege. Jesus, I want you with me. He loves you. And again, he says, and behold, <clears throat> this is in um, Revelation 22, 12, last chapter in the Bible. Behold, I come quickly. And if that was true then, boy, is it true today. And my reward is with me to give to every man. He's coming to give rewards. He's also coming for the restitution of all things. There's a number of reasons. But he's really coming to gather his children. He sends his angels to gather together his elect. Are the wicked destroyed? Yes. Why? By the brightness of his coming. It's because they still have sin in them. And the presence of the Lord, the light of God, is a consuming fire on the lost. Amen? Number six. <clears throat> what will happen to the righteous people when Jesus comes a second time? Well, there's a number of things in the Bible. First Thessalonians, we've already looked at, but let's review that. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and then the dead in Christ will rise first. So the righteous Christians who are alive in the world don't go before the dead who are resurrected when Jesus comes. The graves are opening up when Jesus comes. Does that sound like a secret to you? And this is happening in concert with this massive earthquake. All the graves in the world opening up. You know how many graves there must be that the angels have marked all over the planet? And the Bible even says the sea gave up the dead. And you might be wondering, Doug, how is the Lord going to reassemble all these people's parts? <laughs> Write that down. Send it in. <laughs> Again, you can read in 1 Corinthians 15. The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. They're resurrected with glorified bodies and those who are alive get this body changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And it goes on to say, then we who are alive when the Lord comes, we are caught up together with them. Who's that? The resurrected saints to meet them in the air. And we meet them with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's how it's going to happen when Jesus comes. Does that sound like a secret to you? We're just reading it right out of the Bible. A matter of fact, I'll submit to you, I believe that anybody who came here tonight with no preconceived ideas would never come to the place where they believe the secret rapture. It is a doctrine that was 
concocted, it was manufactured with a political purpose in mind, it was marketed very successfully, but it is not biblical, and the great Bible minds of the past never believed this. And you should do the research for yourself. I'm going out on a limb, and you ought to check on me and see if I'm right. And send in your questions. If, if uh, you can show me where this has been the biblical teaching of the church, the foundation of God's church over the ages, it is a fairly new doctrine that is confusing a lot of people. In my radio program, you'd be amazed how many times people call. As a matter of fact, we don't even take the question because it's so frequently, it's redundant. Pastor Doug, I've been studying this secret rapture and I'm looking for the scriptures. Can you help me find them? And I say, no, they're not there. I can't help you find them. If you want to find out about the glorious coming of the Lord, there's a lot of scripture on that. But the idea of it being a secret, it's not there. Number seven, what will happen to the wicked? When Jesus comes again, do they live on for another seven years? With the Antichrist and the 144,000 Jews preaching the gospel, you might want to ask some questions about those things. It says, when the Lord comes, and then shall that wicked be revealed who the Lord will consume when he comes. He'll consume with the brightness of his mouth and will, um, with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So what happens to the wicked when he comes? Do they go on for another seven years or are they destroyed by the brightness of his coming? And some say, well, that, Doug, that's seven years later. Nowhere in the Bible do you find the scripture splitting the rapture from the second coming. It's all united. It's interwoven through the Bible. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. You've got to stay with me. This is a long one. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man, speaking of the second coming here, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who will be able to stand? And they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. This is happening simultaneous with the trumpet, the roar, the shout of the archangel, the rapture, the resurrection, it is all woven together. You could link all these scriptures together in the Bible as one harmonious event. You cannot split it in half with seven years. Sorry about getting worked up on this, but you know what worries me? I'll tell you why I get excited about this. Misunderstanding this can set the stage for the devil to impersonate Christ and you to be deceived. So it is so important that you understand this, friends. Number eight, how will Christ's second coming affect the earth itself? What's going to happen on the planet when Jesus comes? Is it going to be where you're just going to read it in the headlines and not know? We read, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Everything that can happen to the planet, it says islands are swallowed up. Mountains are leveled. Uh, volcanoes are erupting. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but you can count on it. And so the earth is going through this massive convulsion. That's why Paul says the whole creation groans and travails in labor. And when Jesus comes, it's the final convulsion of nature itself. When Jesus came the first time and he died on the cross, was there an earthquake? Did nature, did the sky go dark? What do you think is going to happen when he comes again? You think you're going to wake up and go to pat your wife on the hand and she's going to be gone, her pajamas are still in bed? I mean, this has been very colorful uh, teaching, but it is not biblical. Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. And a great hail fell from heaven upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Somebody emailed this picture of hailstones from the Midwest that someone took a picture of. Those are tangerine sized hail. They've actually had hail in North America as big as softballs and even bigger in India. I did an amazing fact on it one time. That is nothing compared to the Bible says the hail is going to weigh about a talent. Uh, varying measurements, approximately 56-pound blocks of ice when Jesus comes back. Pummeling the earth. It's going to just, it, it'll be like those uh, bunker-busting bombs that the military has. There's hail coming down. You think that it's going to be a secret? The whole, all of nature is convulsing. Number nine. Does the Bible give specific information regarding the nearness of Christ's second coming? Yes, and I, I have to be very careful at this point because 
Whenever you talk about the imminence and the nearness of Christ's coming, if you get too specific, people think you're setting a day, and I don't believe anyone should ever do that. Jesus said, no man knows the day and the hour. And I still believe that's true. Matter of fact, every now and then there's some, I remember there's a radio host. He's still on the air. It's amazing. I was doing a meeting back in, I think it was 90, was it 96 or 94? When uh, that, uh, you know who I'm talking about, said that he had a national radio program, Jesus is Coming, set the year and got everyone all worked up. Was it 93? No, I think it was later than that. 94? Anyway, I was doing a meeting. It was really good for my attendance because everybody all of a sudden came thinking the world was going to end. And nothing happened. And this has happened. Many people setting dates. You've got to watch out for that because you know what happens? People get let down and they lose all faith in Christianity. That's why I said you don't want to just get ready because you're scared. You want to be ready because you love him. That has to be the motive. But there is information. If you love the Lord, you want to know when he's coming, right? You know, when I've been on a long trip and I start getting home, I start calling Karen along the way. I said, well, I'm in Chicago, and now I'm taking my leg down going through Nevada. And, you know, I called her on the way home. I'm getting closer. And then I call from the garage, you know. <laughs> I'm here <laughs> on the cell phone. Let me share some things with you. If, if you do a little math in the Bible, how many of you have heard of the 7,000-year theory? It's a very simple principle. In 2 Peter chapter 3, speaking of the second coming of the Lord, I see some of you taking notes, and I'm glad you're doing that. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, and Peter is actually quoting from two different psalms when he says that. A thousand years in his sight are as yesterday when it is gone. You know, it's interesting that God said to Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you will die. How long did Adam live? 900 years. No man lived a thousand years. They all died in that day, that first millennia. God works on a principle of six days you work, one day you rest. When you add up the ages in the Bible, anyone can do this. It tells you Adam lived 930 years and so forth. You just add it up and you have to compare a number of passages, but you can get an approximation of roughly how old the world is based on adding up some of these figures. And based, any of you ever heard of Bishop Usher's chronology? It was one of the more widely accepted chronologies. He places the creation at approximately, notice that approximately, I'm not setting dates, 4004 BC. There was 2,000 years from the creation to Abraham, who was born 4, 000, uh, 2004 BC, 2,000 years later. You've got the age of the patriarchs before Abraham. Adam, Noah, Enoch, Methuselah. They weren't Jews. Then from Abraham to Jesus is 2,000 years. You know when Jesus was born? This confuses people. 4 BC. How can Jesus be born four years before Christ, people say. <laughs> but you know what happened is once this monk established the ADBC dating method, years later they found out he was off. But by that time it was all entrenched. It's like your typewriter keyboard. It is the craziest arrangement of letters. Why don't they go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H? I still type with two fingers. It's so embarrassing on a plane. I'll be sitting next to some executive who's going <laughs> and I open my laptop and go ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and I've got to search for the keys. Anyway, after they established the AD BC dating method, they found out through archaeology that King Herod who tried to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, died 2 B.C. He had to die after Jesus was born. So they did a little more math. They realized Christ was probably born about 4 B.C. So you got 4,004 B.C., then to Abraham, 2,004 B.C., the age of the patriarchs. From Abraham to Jesus, the age of Israel. Then Jesus is born. You've got the age of the church or spiritual Israel from 4 B.C. to the second coming. Right about now... It's been 2,000 years from the first coming of Jesus, right? Matter of fact, we're living in that window between his birth and his death right now. Interesting. And how long is the millennium? 1,000 years where we live and reign with Christ like a Sabbath. Friends, we are living in the last generation. I'm certain of it. And look at all the stories in the Bible. I've got a list here. This isn't very pretty, but it's a summary of a number of things. This is a chart. These are just some of the scriptures that talk about the sevens in the Bible. You know, the Jews had a law. For six years you farm your land. The seventh you let it rest. They had a law that for six years you could have a servant. The seventh year he went free. Moses stayed at the base of Mount Sinai. How many of you know, how long was Moses on top of Mount Sinai? 
40 days and 40 nights. But a lot of people don't know, if you read the verses just before that, it says he stayed at the base of the mountain for six days. And at the end of six days, on the seventh day, God called him up into the clouds. He went up, rapture, after seven days. I mean, after the sixth day. Mark chapter 9, you can read where Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he brought them up the glorious mount, this experience where he's transfigured. He makes this statement. He says, Verily I say unto you, there are some of you standing here who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. After he makes that statement, it says, After six days he took them up. Now I wonder if God's trying to tell us something. Read in the Bible the story, you know, there's only one queen of Judea. A wicked queen, daughter of Jezebel, her name was Athaliah. She killed all of the seed of David, tried to kill them all, she missed one, Josiah. Or is it Joash? Joash, sorry. They sound alike. You didn't know, so I, I don't feel so bad. He was hid in the temple of the Lord. For six years she ruled over the land, a despot, wicked woman. I mean, any woman who would kill her grandchildren. At the end of six years, Josiah is brought out of the temple. Joash, thank you, dear. Joash is brought out of the temple, and he is coronated. The trumpets blow. She is slain. The people rejoice. It's a miniature picture of the second coming. Where is our high priest? Where's Jesus now? Isn't he at the right hand of the Father in heaven? And when he comes out of that temple, he's coming back to earth. He's going to receive his kingdom, just like all his parables told us. And that wicked queen you read about in Revelation is going to be destroyed, and he's going to be coronated. The trumpets are going to blow. There's so many parallels in these stories. God is trying to teach us through these symbols, the code of prophecy, to understand that his coming is very close. So it could be that this theory, 6,000 years before the millennium, and we have a lesson on the millennium. You know what that would put us? That would put us in the last generation. I believe some of us here may die. Not too many will die of old age. I think Jesus is coming very soon. Can you say amen? amen. And I should say, this is the most important thing you could be doing because if what I'm saying is true, what is more important than eternity? We're only here a little while and the reason we're here is to get ready to live with God forever. Amen? amen. I hope you'll continue to bring your friends to these meetings because this should be our priority. Seeking first his kingdom. Number 10. How may we know when we are near the last generation? Well, I've just given you some indicators. We talked about a few earlier. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? People will be scoffing, making fun of the second coming. Do we have that today? People that love to ridicule, especially the media. Generally speaking, the media is extremely liberal and they make fun of any uh, Christians who take the Bible seriously and they scoff. And the Bible says that's going to happen in the last days. Scoffing. Also, the Lord has warned us in his word that as it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? There was a great deal of spiritual immorality. Am I right? Perversion. Do we see that very prominent today? Uh, people with perverted lifestyles are clamoring for attention and endorsement. And you're not allowed to call anything wrong anymore without being called intolerant. Oh, by the way, God is intolerant of some things. First Thessalonians, I'm sorry. Um, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. This is verse 1. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Are we living in an age where people are lovers of pleasure? It's like we live for entertainment. And, uh, you know, if the remote control breaks, we're bummed. And what are we going to do now? You know, or the VCR is broken. What are we going to do? Cable went out. We just are constantly need to be entertained. Lovers of pleasure. Spiritualism is another sign. We're just adding these to the signs in our previous presentation. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Is spiritualism in the programming everywhere you look? The Harry Potter and Buffy and the witchcraft and sorcery and just, it has become just ingrained in the culture. There was a day in North America where the church shunned that. Now, our Christians get mad at me for saying anything bad about Harry Potter. I like Harry Potter. 
It's all sorcery. And they, what they do is they make it cute. Isn't that how the devil operates? He tries to make something wicked attractive. How else do you get a fish to eat the bait except you make it look good? These are some of the signs, and there's many more that we could point to. Number 11, how near is the Lord's coming? Well, while we don't know the day and the hour, there are some final signs that we can consider. We want to review a few things that we talked about in our last presentation. We know that there have been wars and rumors of wars, and uh, we've seen that, these massive weapons of destruction. And um, uh, we don't have anything on us. There we go. We've got the natural disasters. We've got weapons that are much more dangerous now than before. The earthquakes, the fires, the floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. We had a whole series of hurricanes just this last year. And these things are accelerating in their intensity. God is trying to tell us through these events that are happening, everything from Turn a camera around. Get a, get a shot of the audience here. Because remember, we've got a lot of friends watching around the world, and we're sort of like the host site. How many of you, when you saw the images of 9-11 happening before you, were wondering, is this the end? Does this mean the end is closer? Is this a sign? Some of you were wondering if it was a Hollywood reenactment. Am I right? And when you heard the reports of the tsunami, were you wondering? God is wanting you to wonder. He, these signs are trying to tell us that the end is near and he wants us to get ready. Friends, I believe Jesus brought us because he's got a plan for you. He says, now when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your eyes, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That's good news. It shouldn't terrify you. It should warn you if you're not ready to give your heart to Jesus. Number 12, how can I be certain that I'll not be deceived by Satan? regarding the second coming of Christ. How can I know? You need to go by the word. For as lightning comes out of the east, Jesus says, even unto the west, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. You know, lightning is one of the brightest lights that we have. And if you see lightning shining from one side of the sky to the other, and you're outside, have you ever tried to close your eyes during a lightning storm and it still goes through your eyelids? I even put my head under the pillow one time Close my eyes and I could still tell when the lightning flashed, not because of the thunder. You know what I'm talking about? Does anyone have to say, did you see that bolt of lightning go from the east to the west? Another way you'll know is if someone shows up walking around on the ground and they say they're Jesus, when Jesus comes again, you notice we're caught up to meet him in the air. Do his feet touch the ground? No, they will at the end of the millennium. We'll talk about that, but not when he comes to rapture up the saints. No. Go by the Bible. According to the law and the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, there is no light in them. We need to find out what is the truth based on the word of God. Amen? Amen. And I'm encouraging you, please, friends, if I've said something and you're wondering about it, ask the questions. Go to the Prophecy Code website, prophecycode.com, and email us your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. We want to arrive at truth together. I'm pleading with you. Jesus warns us, wherefore, if they say to you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Matter of fact, friends, if someone calls and says, hey, you know, he's on TV, turn to channel, I wouldn't even turn. Because I think the devil has hypnotic powers that can mesmerize people. Notice what we've learned about Jesus coming tonight. It tells us in the Bible it is a literal coming. He's going to come like he left. It's personal. He was real when he left. He'll be real when he comes. It's visible. Every eye will see him. It's audible. A shout, a roar, thunder, lightning. Very physical. The earth is going to shake. Every one of your senses will be assaulted with the reality of Jesus coming according to the Bible. It's vitalizing. A resurrection's taking place. Bodies are being transformed. It's glorious. The angels are there filling the heavens. It's climatic, meaning it's the end. That's where those that are saved are saved and those that are lost are lost. There's no extension. When God told Noah to get in the ark, did he give a second chance to those that stayed outside? When God said, Lot, get out of town, did he extend probation for those in Sodom and Gomorrah? And Jesus says, I'm coming back. It's like the days of Lot. It's like the days of Sodom. Get ready because that will be it. The curtain's going down, friends. These fanciful scenarios that have become so popular are dangerous. And we need to know what the Bible really teaches. You know, we're running out of time. And it's so important that we put Jesus first in our lives. Amen. 
You know, there's an interesting story from history about an Antarctic expedition. Ernest Shackleton, Sir Ernest Shackleton, made several expeditions trying to reach the South Pole. Once got within 100 miles, but he did not want to lose his men. So he turned back because he cared so much about his men. He didn't want to risk their lives. He got that close. On another expedition, he and his men got trapped in the ice in their ship. For a year, they floated among the ice flows, almost a year, freezing to death. He knew their only hope of survival was if they could get some help. Some of the men rowed to an island. All of the men rowed to an island. And he realized that they would not survive the winter without help. And he said, I will go for help and I will come back for you. He and a few men in a rowboat went 800 to 1,000 miles to an island where they knew that they could get help. The most uh, incredible conditions that you can imagine. And he had promised them, I'll come back for you. So many times he wanted to give up, but he didn't give up because he kept thinking about his men. Finally, he came back. And boy, were they glad. He found help and he could have rested, but he said, I'm going back for my men with you, with a rescue ship. Made the trip back even though he was half dead. And when his men were rescued, they were all alive and waiting for him. They got on the boat. He said, did you lose hope? They used to call him boss. They said, no boss, we knew you'd come back for us. And he said, were you packed? They said, we were packed. You know, Jesus is telling us, I'm going to come for you. And he cares for you more than Shackleton cared for his men. Are you ready? Are you packed? Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? Amen. Friends, I want to pray for you right now. And I want to pray for those who are watching. He's brought you because he wants you to be ready. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, loving Lord, we are so thankful that you have arrested our attention tonight. Some of us may be uh, troubled by the things that we've learned in our souls. And we hope that's the Holy Spirit. We can see that every one of our senses will be bombarded with the reality of Jesus coming when he comes. I pray that our conclusions will be rooted in the word of God. And Lord, I pray that each person will hear you speak to their hearts and know that they can be ready, that you've sent these messages because you want them to be prepared. That you'll receive us if we come to you just as we are. And right now in each person's heart, I pray that they will say, Lord, I want to be ready. I can't do it without you. But through Christ, all things are possible. Help me to be ready and waiting and packed when Jesus comes. We ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, when is our next meeting? Tomorrow night. Our lesson, very interesting, is the dragon's egg. We're going to talk about the role of evil and where the devil came from. And there's a lot the Bible says that we can be warned about the battle between good and evil. It's still not too late to bring your friends and see their lives changed. Amen? And so we encourage you to come back tomorrow night, tell your friends, and continue to pray for this series that God will bring revival. Amen. As humans, we all have addictions to sin. We're weak and unable to resist temptation. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been working to destroy our happiness and drown out the voice of God with those soul-destroying addictions. Apart from God, we are powerless to resist evil. But by God's grace and power, we can experience true freedom from sin. Today's free offer, Tips for Resisting Temptation, covers 12 practical steps to have real power in your life today. You won't want to miss this practical guide for victorious living. Order online at amazingfacts.tv. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S. and its territories. Or call 1-866-708-PROPHECY. That's 1-866-708-7767. Ask for the free offer number 708 when you call. Or write to us at Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Don't resist the temptation to order this book. The entire Prophecy Code seminar is available on DVD, VHS, CD, and audio cassette. Please ask for the respective offer number listed on the screen that matches the format you desire. To order, call 1-866-708-PROPHECY or 1-866-708-7767. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S., or its territories. Or write to Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. The future is now. Share it with a friend. God bless you, friends, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you.